In this video, you're going to see here, this is a diagnosis of a 2009 Chrysler Town & Country for electrical issues, such as the instrument cluster dropping out. And it was much more than that, but you know, we review the codes, we go through the process of diagnosis, kind of how it, how it all played out by looking at a lot of the stored data. And that's the first half. The second half is going to be how I tested the circuits and got to the conclusion and found the problem. So enjoy. All right, here we go. This was a good one. This is one of those jobs where technicians scramble, run in the opposite direction. Understandably, communication issues are not fun to diagnose uh, half the time. But the more you do it, like everything, and the easier it gets. My advice to any younger technicians that want to get more money in their industry is learn how to diagnose communication issues. So we'll look at this first. The, the repair order stated that the instrument cluster was dropping out, speedometer would drop out. Like most repair orders, it was very vague. A lot of information gets relayed to the service writers, but you need to absolutely, in this situation where it's intermittent, you need to ask questions. The next best thing to do is to review the freeze frame data. Now, not every scan tool has uh, body module event data. Um, there's also a need for having a good uh, strategy on what to do with 30 plus codes like this. So in this situation, if they're all stored, for example, you, you know, you just want to basically get a game plan. And the game plan that works for me is going to be, when did these codes set? What mileage? What set first and what set last and in between? On this one here, we have codes listed top to bottom and they are not in order. So in other words, if you have a code at the top, that doesn't mean that's the first code that's set. Unfortunately, that was never thought of by the people that created this software. So the odometer values with blue, 106, 657, we can basically cross off our list here. So that helps us quite a bit because there's quite a bit of those codes that set because that fuse was pulled out in the past because the sliding door actuator wouldn't stop going. So we cross out a good number of those, those stored codes because we got information from the customer. That gives us a glimmer of hope. Speed sync, we'll speed up the diagnosis a little bit. All right, so now we have the codes listed from the first code to the last at the bottom. Lost communication code in the door module front left, lost communication in the front right, the body module called the TIPM is saying the CAN interior bus is not working. We have a lost COM with the front door left module. So we're going to kind of do a visual on, on how this is going, at, going to play out in real time. And that's going to pop up in a second here. So it's always good to visualize and be a good visualizer if you're going to be diagnosing complex communication issues because it's like electrical you know you need to think of what's happening because you can't see it you're not going to see electrons flowing you can see some things like can communication on a scope but not a lot so this is what the topology looks like on this 2009 chrysler town and country we have our door module front left dmfl and the other modules on the CAN interior bus. That 125K is the speed that it, they talk to each other. And that's important because if you try to tie in a, a CAN C module like the PCM and you tied it into this network, it, they wouldn't talk to each other because they need to be operating at the same frequency and speed. So, all right, that was the first code right there. And that's what the event data looks like. Door module front left lost communication with our IPM, TIPM, which is a body module. So something to keep in mind here is that, you know, if it's a, another car company that uses a body module, a lot of times they have different names, but yeah, they function in a lot of the same ways. 
Sometimes they split up body functions into multiple modules. Sometimes they use a, a different network type, like a K-line network, single wire network for door modules. In this case, our vehicle is using a CAN-C network. So it's a much faster speed than a single wire system. So that's a plus. All right, so this code, we can see the original mileage it set, frequency counter. And that was that module right there that's saying, hey, we lost communication. And it's saying it lost it with the tip -um only. So that's not saying it lost communication with every module, just the tip -um. That's what it's trying to say is that, hey, I can't get a hold of the tip -um. And that's what that code is saying. All right, our next code was a DMFR, door module front right, so that's passenger front, lost communication with the tip -um, just like the other door module that we just talked about. Happened 119 times. And it's saying, hey, the tip -um won't pick up. I can't talk to the tip -um. Okay, that's what it looks like on this apology. Okay, here's our third code. The TIPM is saying that the CAN interior bus has an issue. It can't talk to anybody. It happened 38 for 38 minutes. And that's what it looks like. And this information where it's saying, I can't talk to the can interior bus, that's being sent out in the pulses of the can message on the scope that we'll look at in a second here. Fourth code, lost communication with front door module left, so DMFL, which was the first code to set. The first code again was, hey, I can't talk to the tip -um, and that was a DMFL. So I don't know if you're starting to notice a pattern here, but I started to notice a pattern, and that's why it's nice to have all this written out and maybe use uh, sketch paper or scratch paper to just kind of go through the timeline of events, like it, I guess a detective might. Okay, now we're going to look at a video where we're actually going to the vehicle and we're going to try and induce a failure based off of the information that we had. Now, before I continue playing this video, if you remember the codes that we had, the codes were, the code was starting with the door module front left, not communicating with another module. There's this 50-50 chance in my experience that that is the area we need to focus on. So it would make sense for me to go to the door, door module up front on the left because it was the first module to set a code and start wiggling and looking at wires at the door jam harness. Why the door jam harness? Because when you do electrical diagnosis, you need to visualize what's moving a lot. And the most common issue is um, seat harnesses having issues, uh, door, door jam harnesses having issues. Why? Because they move a lot. So I start wiggling the wiring here it's a door harness, it's a jam there. And when I start to do that, I see a flicker in the dash lights. That's the illumination lights coming on. This is what it looks like on the topology. The modules are dropping out when I wiggle the door jam harness. So that's another indicator that we have something going on inside of that door harness. 
those two modules right there, DMRL, DMRR, those are the sliding doors. That's because the fuse is out. So ignore that. But right now you see the door module front left, which was the first code to set, like we talked about. That one right now is still not coming up. Okay, here we go. So this is a scope view at the door module, the front left door module, when it's failing, when I wiggle the wires at the door jam. That is obviously a, a bad signal. We don't have enough of a voltage difference to allow communication with the network. But that's also dropping our entire CAN interior bus network like you saw in the topology. So you can actually have an open in your CAN communication network. So you're, you can have it open your wiring on your vehicle and that open can cause the entire network to drop like this because there's a change in impedance, which means resistance in essence. So you don't want to assume that because somebody told you you can have an open on CAN interior that it's going to be okay. In this case, it proves that you cannot have an open on a CAN interior vehicle because of the change in resistance on this application. Every car can be a little different. They make different protocol uh, s protocols, I believe. So you can have fault tolerant CAN interior systems, but it's up to the manufacturer if they want to pay for the extra technology. So now I need to get into this door jam harness and see what it looks like. And I don't know if you can see this yet, but there's actually a, a connector that someone tried to temporarily repair this or maybe in their mind permanently repair this power wire. It could have been a power wire too to the door module, but chances are that's not the case because if you take power away from a, a module, like pull a fuse, it really should, that shouldn't typically cause a whole network to drop because you're not changing the resistance inside of the module for the termination resistance. And a lot of guys have been trained to be told that there's only two terminating resistors, but in reality, there's resistance in every module. You'll have 120 ohm, 120 ohm, and then like two to 8,000 ohms in each module. Uh, every bit of that resistance in all the modules is pretty important. So I'm pulling it back. I don't see anything other than that poorly connected red wire, which I'll fix later in my repair. I'm tugging on wires here with what we call the tug test. And there's actually no wires that are popping out. Usually if there's a fully broken wire, that wire is going to pull right out. Or if it's partially broken, it's going to pull right out. You just don't want to tug too hard, obviously. This is that door module, the DMFL. That's what the harness looks like where the interior bus wires are going through. So this right here is the normal CAN interior high speed DVOM signal. So 2.6 volts, ignition's on, vehicle's running. I'm back probing at the DMFL in the door. I got 2.6 volts on the high side. It's fluctuating a little bit, but it stays pretty close to 2.6 volts. Keep in mind your high and low voltage at, at the time of testing should equal five volts. So for example, 2.6 and 2.4 on the low, that gives you five. That's what the wires look like at the door jam. That's a good signal on the can low. 2.4 volts. See how it fluctuates a little bit? That's fine. It's averaging out the signal. All right, that's our can low at the door jam, not at the module. All right, now I'm checking at the module unplugged and I've got 1.4 volts and that is not okay. It's dropping to zero volts sometimes, but yeah. 
so I've got a voltage difference. It's changing in voltage here. It's not close to 2.3 volts. This is what I would consider abnormal. This is not okay. At times it drops to zero volts. Okay, that's definitely a you know, failure in that harness, but I need to figure out where it's at. This harness is obsolete. This is a repairable problem. We don't need to replace the harness in most cases. So I know it's on the can low, which is the white with the orange trace. So I do a tug test again, because I know it's in this area. And I tug on it and I'm tugging and I realize the wire is stretching out. So this wire is stretching out because we got a break inside that wire. For that to happen, uh, that wire had to be pinched somehow. I'm not entirely sure what could have pinched that wire. That's not even a, you know, typically from a, a door shutting and closing all the time. Usually that only happens on the bigger wires. So it was a, a pretty abnormal find, but it does happen. Sometimes these wires break in, in, within the insulation on harnesses that don't even move. They could be running along the frame. We really can't say what hit that wire or caused that wire to break inside. Maybe it was a movement, but that's all it took to have the can interior bus drop out like that. One single open circuit. So interesting find. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>